The following program is brought to you by Marshfield Community Television. On May 10th, 1940, the Germans, Hitler had planned a raid on Fort Iban Imal. According to the Allies, it was impenetrable. Hitler's, Hitler's strategy was to be able to march through Belgium and go into France, and he captured uh, uh, Luxembourg uh, and, and to capture Luxembourg and France and that he would have access to the coast and it he would be freewheeling. He'd already marched through Europe. The war had started, World War II had started in the fall of 1939 in September. And, but he needed, he needed an access. So he wanted to capture the Verhoeven Bridge. He wanted to ha capture the Kame Bridge. And he wanted to ha capture the Vanderhagel Bridge. He flew in 42 gliders and 483 men in the dead of night on this impenetrable hill. The men who were there thought that it was the British. When they heard the, when they heard the, the tow planes coming in, they thought, oh, well, that's just the British, even though they had been warned. And again, this was supposed to be impenetrable. They took the bridges and they took the fort. They did not take the Cambridge, but they took the, they took the fort. This caught the United States sleeping. They were like, oh my goodness gracious sakes, this is a whole new war strategy. The fact that you can fly a group of men in with equipment, drop them behind enemy lines, and form up and fight. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary event. General Hap Arnold then, then decided that we'd better do something. Well, what they did was they studied the German gliders, uh, their design, and their program. They eventually created a training program. They, many of them formed up at Fort Howes and were trained and, be, and became glider riders and glider training pilots, uh, glider, glider riders and glider pilots. It was really the beginning of a, of a, a esprit de corps uh, in the United States Army Air Corps. <coughs> Howard Moore, there was a, in 19, this, it took them until 1942 to design a program. And 18 men were called to Washington uh, with the idea that we needed to train glider pilots. Howard Moore, uh, who was a famous Wisconsin barnstormer and head of the Wisconsin Aviation, or was eventually inducted into the Wisconsin Aviation Hall of Fame, was already teaching a, an air uh, dogfighting and Navy program at the University of Wisconsin and, at, and in Madison and at Truax Field. But he was the person that had gone to Washington and later on he said, we were called to Washington because we were supposed to be part of a secret project. Eventually, he said, we knew that it was part of the D-Day. It became what, you know, the D-Day project of flying the gliders in. But he flew around Wisconsin, and he went to Janesville, and he said to the, to the city fathers, we need a place where we can establish our glider school. He, the glider uh, pilots came in the spring of 1942, and uh, he was commissioned to house them and train them, and the Janesville YMCA had just been built. They were deeply in debt, and, and so he said, well, can I house the glider pilots here? And they said, oh yeah, we'd love to have them. So they, it was a great place for them, um, and that was, there were 200 glider pilots that came in every three weeks. <coughs> 
They flew off of the Atkinson farm. And there were three locations that he decided that they needed three, three airfields to do the training, according to the government spec specs. And the Atkinson farm still is in existence. And you see the, uh, see the original Quonset hut building that was built uh, for the glider training where they conducted the classroom training. They were in three townships, the Bradford Rock and La Prairie townships. And uh, it, was, it was an area that, one, you stand up on the top of the hill and it's now a soybean farm. And it's an extraordinary view. And you have to just drop down into this valley. <coughs> he ran out, of, uh, ran out of room at the Atkinson farm where it was the office. And he uh, contracted with the Jackman, at the Jackman building. Uh, and that was where the, the government part of it and he, where his office was. But Howard Morey, before he established the Janesville uh, Glider School, he came to Anago. And he also went to uh, um, further south in Wisconsin, right along the river but they decided that there was too much sand along the river and it would get into the propellers and that was a problem. He came to Anago and uh, he tried to contract to, to bring the glider school to Anago before Janesville. And the Anago people said, well, no, you can't have the land because we've already planted our potato fields. This was in the spring. And so they were not very happy. However, when he left, and established the school in Janesville, the Anago father said, oops, oops, we just missed out on a huge economic project here. And what did they do? They ran out and they extended and they bought those potato fields from Mr. Derrick and from the, the uh, other families. And they consolidated it and bought the runways and, and extended the runways and said, wow, we're going to have a glider school here. They built this Quonset hut, and it was built by, uh, in, uh, 50, by 50 building for training under construction in June of 1942, and Walter Betcher was the local contractor for the project. And so they built, the hang they built that hangar. Then it was like, well, we've lost Mr. Morey because he's down in Janesville, so who are we going to get to run the school? Well, E. Merritt Anderson uh, was a friend of Mr. Morey's, or at least, a, I can't say a friend, but at least a business acquaintance who had a school in Milwaukee at the Milwaukee County Airport and also in Fond du Lac. And E. Merritt Anderson was very well known. Uh, he later went on to the Malden Air Force Base and taught, uh, taught pilots for the Korean War. Um, so his school, um, so he consented to come up here and to teach, uh, teach the glider pilots. Well, they had to have some place to stay, and this isn't exactly the YMCA. <laughs> All right. this, is, this was a program created by the, uh, the National Youth Administration uh, Barracks. Well, it had been a program that was very similar to CCC, trying to bring students uh, and and kids uh, to train them during the depression or during the depression to give them jobs uh, to help their families. They stayed in these buildings. Okay, so th these buildings still exist out on the edge of town. Um, so I walked inside of it. It had a cement floor. It had a uh, pot belly stove, and it's made of corrugated side uh, metal. Now, this program for the glider pilots was running from the spring of 1942 until the November of 1942. So it's hot, it's corrugated, there are very few windows, and, um, and it was very cold in the, in the late fall as well. But that didn't deter the glider pilots. They came and they had a very good time here in Anago. They said that this was probably uh, uh, later on the National World War II Glider Pilots Association said that many of the men remembered for years later on all of the fun times that they had had and appreciated the hospitality that the, uh, that the people of Anago had given them. <coughs> 
The Backbone Hotel was one of their favorite hangouts. Uh, there were local dances, and Arlene uh, Bubon said, quote, well, I had a date with one of them, but that was enough. <laughs> okay. She said, in, she, say, she said that very emphatically. Um, some of the women in Anago married, uh, married the glider pilots. And one of, Mary Ann Zemke said, uh, remember the glider pilots, she said, quote, the glider pilots came from all over the United States. They were all young and a nice group. Many were from big cities and probably thought it was an adventure to come to a small town. This is the inside of the Backbone Hotel. It, it has a more rustic feel than the Hoffman House. Um, but the, the, here's the, remember Brady last night was talking about just a bed and a, you know, a dresser and sort of the gathering of the, uh, in the dining room. The other hotel where really they partied uh, was the Butterfield Hotel. And, and they, really, they really had a great time. It's one of the more interesting, interesting hotels because it became the Hotel Quigley, but there are palm trees in it. <laughs> and a deer with the antlers. Okay, I'm not sure about this. Uh, it just doesn't quite, quite match up. Uh, leaving Anago, the glider pilots had more training sessions, but they had enjoyed their time here. And, but they had first in, had to go to the tech, you know, have a lot of glider pilot training. And they did this at the middle, this is now the Anago Middle School. You can see this building. Um, and the training, the training they had classes that covered navigation, maintenance, meteorology, instruments, aircraft identification, and chemical warfare defense. And they had 24 hours of physical training and nine hours of customs of service and military indoctrination. And much of it was held here at the, at the middle school. Their flying part was a little different. Their flying part were two hours of stalls and spins Four hours were spent flying 180 degree approaches with the engine off at 2,000 feet with the emphasis on high approaches, S turns and slips. Many of them would use that when they went to Europe. Five hours were allotted to ignition off approaches at 3,000, 1,200, 1,500, 1,500 feet. Five hours were devoted to landing at a mark without using brakes to develop judgment Five hours were given for night landings with ignition off at 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 feet. Five hours were to be at a strange field landings with the ignition off and a landing point at around 5,000 feet. And four hours were then devoted to phases of the course needed per student training. Now, Mr. Morey, who uh, uh, conducted the glider training as well, had a cadre of instructors that included his son, uh, included his son Richard, but also Mr. Woodward, who later went on and did stunts in, in Hollywood. I think part of that had come from training glider pilots. But um, he did not, they were supposed to put, uh, it was supposed to be absolutely dark. And, and he said no. He said that is an accident waiting to happen. So he put smudge pots on the corners of the field so that at least they would have some, some frame of reference. This is a, a graduating glider class in 1942. And leaving Anago, the glider pilots had several more training sessions before they joined their squadrons. They then proceeded overseas to land their gliders on rocky shores of Sicily, in the jungle clearings of Burma, and some of the glider pilots had dangerous missions. Some of the glider pilots that had trained in Anago were captured, some were wounded, and some were killed. Unfortunately, that's part of the price of war. And that was a quote from the National World War II Glider Pilots Association when they were talking about their training here in Anago. Um, it was a, a it, it, I want to emphasize and stress this because there's a misconception that glider pilots flew the cargo gliders in their beginning primary training. And they did not. They were using uh, 
tailor craft, and they were using Pipers, and they were using uh, L-type aircraft, single engine aircraft. The aircraft went up, and then the instructors turned the ignition switch off, and then they glided in to land. They did not get to fly the cargo gliders, many of them, until they went to Europe uh, and were uh, and behind the tow plane, behind the C-47s. So when they graduated, they, they graduated and they received their glider wings and their ultimate training, and they thought G stood for guts. <laughs> okay, that's what they, they all said, that because there was a great, great divide between those that were regular pilots and then the ones that were glider pilots. And there were lots of fights, too. The, in a glider cockpit, um, it was spacious, but it was very perilous. It was just put together, uh, those seats move. Um, it was just tubular steel, and uh, sort of these seats are plush in comparison to what they were sitting in for hours and hours and hours and flying. The, glide, the glider pilots and the glider riders went in for Operation Market Garden. And in Operation Market Garden, there were so many wounded that they asked for volunteers to bring in, uh, um, for the glider pilots to come in and then pick up the wounded. And that was the first time that they had done really a snatch, uh, a, a snatch in combat, where they, the, the plane comes down and swoops down and then tows the, tows the cargo glider out. And they had, um, they had beds of the wounded. Uh, on the planes. This was all done with the 82nd Airborne, and they expected casualty rates of over 80% uh, in most of the battles. This is an example of a, of a uh, towing, and this is your C-47 hauling the, hauling the gliders. There were, there were some very famous incidents uh, one, they thought that they, you know, Henry Kaiser had gotten tired of having his, his Liberty ships going to the bottom of the sea, so they thought that they could, uh, they could bring it with the, that they could tow the equipment over on the gliders. Well, they tried it. Only the problem was is that there's no heat, and there's, you know, not a lot of instrumentation. So they're flying through the clouds, and the glider got ahead of the, C-47, which wasn't really very good. And not only that, but, but when they got to England, the bananas that they had in there were frozen. So that was the end of the idea of having it as a, as a possible alternative. Normandy in the, uh, 1944. Normandy is, is, was considered, and if you've read Stephen Ambrose's book, D-Day, it was really, the, they say it was the finest hour. The 82nd Airborne went in and they captured the, the bridge uh, and the intersection of all the roads in 20 minutes. And it was the glider, it was really the glider guys. Um, it was a huge miscalculation. They did expect 80% 80, 80 uh, casualties. They only had 60% casualties because you see the, all the tree line. They thought those were hedgerows, but their concept of hedgerows were bushes. No, those were full on trees. So they landed, and you know there are pictures of the gliders landing with you know in the field with cows, um, but but they it was just a helter skelter, uh, helter skelter uh, deal for them. Many it was a one way trip. The glider pilots were not given uh, arms or rifles or anything. Uh, there were 15 guys on the glider, and and two of them were the pilot and the co-pilot, but. Without any, they were just told to fight their, you know, grab a rifle somewhere, maybe from a dead guy, and fight their way out. Uh, it was a, an extraordinary mission, and they always talk not in terms of their casualties, but in terms of their mission. Operation Varsity was another one of their one of their battles, and uh, it's a one way trip. And many, many of them crashed. The casualty rate was huge. The most famous, the most famous 82nd Airborne is James Magellis. He's from Fond du Lac. He's the most decorated 82nd Airborne ever. In 2014, he was awarded the Audie Murphy Award. He's nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
and he was in Wisconsin uh, very recently. He's, if you haven't read his book, All the Way to Berlin, he fought from North Africa all the way to Berlin uh, and through, an, through the toughest battles, Anzio uh, and Sicily, and he was in uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Another glider rider, Wisconsin glider rider, is Les Schwarm. He's from Wassa, and uh, he, <coughs> he said, we only, he said, <laughs> He said, they told us that if you sat in the last seat in the glider, the Germans couldn't shoot straight. So if you sat in the last seat and were the first one out at the door, you weren't going to get killed. <laughs> OK, Walt Pilkowski is really responsible for the 82nd Memorial in, uh, in Stevens Point. Les is responsible for the Battle of the Bulge Monument in Wassa on the courthouse. He, he died three years ago. He was very active going into the schools and talking about uh, um, glider riders in the World War II and the point of service. Frank Parzaka is from Armstrong Creek. And, and he came to one of the presentations. And he said, he came up to me afterwards. And he said, Sarah, he said, we aren't heroes. He said, we were just doing our job. He said, and I didn't want to steal Les Schwarm's thunder, who he, he had spoken to, who had spoken before. He said, but I he said I was in three, uh, three glider battles. He was in the Bulge Operation Market Garden and Varsity. The Radis Lumber and Veneer Company in Marshfield. Why is this important? Is because they are the ones that provided the plywood for the troop carrier gliders. It was that quarter inch glider, a uh, quarter inch plywood that had was waterproof glue. That had, uh, that had, which they had, in, were the only people in the United States that had that. They had, ironically enough, the German hot press, and the glue had come from Germany. And during the war, of course, then they had to develop their own, and they had two chemists from the Wisconsin uh, Paper Chemistry Institute. The largest glider manufacturer was Ford Motor Company, making, making 11,000 gliders. And they snatched many of them out. Uh, and, they also, and the other company was Northwestern Aeronautical out of Minneapolis. Uh, Northwestern Aeronautical was started by John Parker, who was a Naval uh, Academy graduate. And he had been an investment banker and had banked uh, Northwestern Airlines. During the war, he, uh, he's shown here, uh, right here, during the war, he got the glider contract, and he used all of Northwestern Airlines, uh, their hangar at Chamberlain Field, their people, their equipment, uh, and they were the second largest manufacturer uh, manufacturing uh, 5,000 gliders. They were, their co-subcontractors were Villem Corporation, in, and Duponti in Minneapolis. I showed you a picture of the glider cockpit, but the World War II History Roundtable has done a full restoration. If you're interested in seeing a glider, uh, you can go to Iron Mountain, or you can go to Granite Falls uh, in Minneapolis, or outside of, Min or west of Minneapolis, to see the total restoration that they worked on with, with the assistance of Willem and all of their woodworking people. The granular or the tubing for the gliders was made by Haywood Wakefield, and we've ta often talked about how they transitioned, uh, companies transitioned from m making whatever their primary product was to a war product. And Haywood Wakefield was a furniture manufacturer, and they were they had a subsidiary making the tubular steel. Another one was the uh, glider uh, was Consoweld in, in Wisconsin Rapids. The Forest Products Lab had developed Paprig. Uh, uh, it looks like wax paper, and you hot press it, and it becomes what you're sitting on right here or can touch, which is formica, or the beginnings of plastic. This was an experimental, it was, you could mold it when it was hot, and this was supposed to be a snow glider, and this was the nose of the, of the experimental snow glider made out of that material. Here that it is, the women are sorting the sheets of pap rig, and Consoweld had gotten into this because they had developed uh, a, a truck body floor that they imprinted with a screen. 
and they could, um, uh, it became a glider floor. And they were, so they were manufacturing that because they had taken the pap rig and developed the, the, the molding. All of this, all of this is that material. And then here's the floor that's, or the top of the floor that's put on top. Notice the holes, that was to make it super light. We were trying to make, make the, obviously, light so, so it wasn't a, uh, overweight, and, uh, even though it was a huge aircraft. Here's the floor, uh, or at least this, with the imprinted screen, and there's the finished floor. They supplied to Northwestern Aeronautical, and another manufacturer of gliders was Pratt Reed. I told you the story of the bananas. They called it the Voodoo Glider, and it was Pratt Reed's. The gliders could have, uh, this is a, a wing panel, and you can see the, 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 the molded panels here. Yeah, you can see the individual panels. Um, it held a mini bulldozer. It held a howitzer or it held a jeep, and the only man who got, got killed uh, in the glide, actually in a glide, the highest ranking officer was a general. He was sitting in the jeep when they crash landed because he wouldn't assume the crash position, and he, his neck was broken. Cessna was another manufacturer of the gliders. Um, they really got saved with this bobcat, which was known as the crane in Canada. And after the depression, during, or at the end of the depression, Canada contracted for them to make the Bobcat. Uh, so th when the war came and they got the glider contract, they worked with Boeing and, Boeing and Beechcraft. And they manufactured uh, 720 gliders. Steinway, here's the change. So they're making pianos? Um, no, they're making glider parts. They contracted with General, General Aircraft in New York, and General Aircraft was then supplying pieces, parts to, uh, to Ford as well. Steinway is a, uh, here's one of their pictures, and I love this picture because um, Theodore Steinway in his book, Steinway and Sons, uh, said, well, he said the war was really something. He said, we had to modify our uniforms, because suddenly we had women working in, the, working in the plant, and our uniforms didn't fit them very well. So not only that, but we had to change our bathrooms. Uh, this was, you know, they, he, <laughs> so this is the Susie Bell, and this is the front, uh, he's holding the tow rope. Can't help it. Okay, he's holding the tow rope. So the end of it was the, um, the glider pilots, at the end of the war, they wanted to come to have a reunion in, in Anago. And they, but they gave us a, a plaque to the city of citizens of Anago, and it said, the American World War II military glider pilots, an elite group of volunteers who have gone largely unrecognized by the American public despite their dramatic and hazardous training and missions will over the next two years be featured in exhibits in dozens of aviation and military museums and in communities where they trained of where they had their huge glide and where the huge gliders were built. They tried to have a reunion and make Anago the permanent home of glider reunions. That didn't happen. But I like the quote and, um, and it really sums up what they said. Imagine f flying a flimsy, unarmed, fabric-covered CG-4A glider loaded with infantrymen, cartons of high-explosive ammunition, gasoline, and TNT at treetop level, through a murderous barrage of heavy flak to crash land in a tiny field surrounded by 50-foot-tall trees, flooded and planted with big anti-aircraft poles and deadly landmines. Then, as you crawl out of the wreckage with your glider, you are charged with big tanks and hostile enemy forces, tossing hand grenades and firing small arms, mortar, and machine gun fire at you. It really is a tribute to the 82nd Airborne, and uh, as they flew over, uh, as they flew over Europe, they are the men to be admired. And, and if you ever see one, thank them for their service. Thank you. <laughs>